from the heart of Providence, Rhode Island. Let me tell you about an amazing place called Syria, the cradle of ancient civilizations. This was an introduction to a video created by our guest today. So let's go to the interview. Hello again to a new episode of the Asaka webcast. In this episode, we host another successful Syrian uh, expert. He's a scholar with a primary research interest in fo and focus on student retention policies and international education. He's an assistant professor of English at the Community College of Rhode Island and an adjunct professor of higher education at the Arkansas State University, where he got his uh, doctorate in education. He is a member of SACA, and today he will join us uh, to discuss one of his uh, passions and hobbies, which is filmmaking and creating independent uh, documentaries about Syria in general, and in particular about uh, Syria's castles and ancient uh, landmarks. With this, uh, welcome Dr. Ali Khalil. I hope you're Thank doing you. well today. I'm doing very well, and I appreciate you for uh, inviting me to your podcast series. I've been following with you for quite some time, and uh, you're doing a great job, and uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this episode. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for uh, uh, agreeing to speak with us, and uh, we hope that uh, this will be a very uh, enriching conversation that will help other people also to benefit from it and come forward with their own uh, ideas and skills that we would like to showcase on our podcast as well. Uh, with Absolutely. this, I'd like to ask you some questions. Uh, the first question is, how did this idea occur to you? Where where did you come up with this idea of creating documentaries for Syria? And when did this start? Right. So it started in 2018, and specifically during the holiday season of 2018. Uh, I had been away from Syria for almost 10 years, uh, consecutive and solid 10 years. Uh, so during one of that my first visit, if you will, to Syria after being away for such a long time, um, I'm not sure if a lot of your audience members believe in coincidences. Uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But essentially, I was walking um, in the streets of Tartus, which is my hometown. This is where I was born and raised before moving permanently to the United States. I was walking by uh, an ancient uh, cathedral, uh, which is now a museum. It's known as the Museum of Tartus, but it is actually a, it's an ancient land, landmark built by, not by the Knights Templar, which is a crusader order. I think most people have heard of the Templars more than the Hospitallers or the Teutonic Knights, for example, other uh, uh, crusader orders. So the church was built by the Templars, but it's now a museum. And as I was walking by it, um, I wanted to show parts of it to my friends who lived in the United States. Um, so I asked my mother at the time, who was walking with me, to actually hold my phone. I did not have any equipment, did not have a, a professional camera. I said, could you please hold the phone for me while I say a couple of words? And I did. And it was very basic knowledge on the site. Um, in fact, I wasn't even allowed to go in because at the time, and due to the um, conflict that was happening at the time, uh, the museum or the cathedral was closed to the public uh, in an effort to preserve what was inside of it, the artifacts. So I walked around, I said a couple of words, just very basic history about it and went ahead and, and went ahead and posted it on my Facebook page. Um, and forgot about the whole thing. The very next day, um, and due to the time difference, uh, you know, I, I woke up and uh, realized it was daytime in the United States, and my Facebook page, um, it, it just blew up with comments and reactions and uh, a lot of questions from my friends and coworkers uh, here in America. And that's when I realized that there is a genuine interest in learning more about that part of Syria, at least. Uh, as opposed to the constant negative imagery that you hear about uh, on mm -hmm. television, on 
through the mainstream media. So a week later and during the same visit, I went to uh, Margat Castle, uh, known as Al Markov Castle for Syrians. Uh, and um, it was also very impromptu. It was not, I did not have a script. I did not have a microphone, uh, just, you know, a, a cell phone. That's really all I had. Um, went up there uh, and said the same thing, just basic information about the castle and how the nice hospitaler who participated in constructing the castle as it looks like now, um, you know, used to live in the castle. Just very, very basic things. Uh, and uh, did not post it immediately because it was such a long uh, film uh, or uh, a clip, if you will. And uh, I waited to, to come back to the States where I had a better internet connection uh, and when I had him posted it. And I do remember vividly um, an hour after I posted that particular uh, video on my Facebook page. Again, I didn't have YouTube at the time. I was with my friend, uh, Michael Brown, uh, who will probably be watching this episode at some point. Uh, we were sitting down and talking and we could we could physically and visibly see the numbers of views change on my Facebook page. You could actually count the numbers of views on that specific video. And within an hour time, it went up to 3,000 and some views, uh, wow. over 44 shares, uh, hundreds of comments. And, and that's when it hit me that, hey, you know what? This is, there is a genuine interest. There's a, there's a, a sense of curiosity among the American public, at least within that circle of friends and colleagues, uh, to learn more about Syria and its cultural sites. So uh, based on that, I uh, went ahead and created a YouTube channel uh, and started creating, you know, very short documentaries, independent documentaries about Syria's landmarks with, of course, uh, from that point onward, uh, it became more of a professional endeavor where I would write the script and um, add all the other variables to the content. That's how it started. That's yeah. how, how we are right now. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can tell the, the difference and the progression and the quality of the videos that you posted. Uh, I've, I've seen the first one you mentioned uh, back in the, the first one about the Markup Castle. Then the latest one you did on the Markup Castle uh, lately, which is very uh, professional. We had actors acting in it, and you had really uh, some professional equipment and a drone and so on used uh, in your production. So I, I could see that progression. It's really very impressive. Well, so, uh, yeah, how do you see the, uh, uh, the audience? Uh, how do they, I mean, how does the content that you provide resonate with your audience? So, so largely, and, and, and obviously you can say, uh, you can't really provide a solid answer uh, that is 100% positive or 100% negative. I mean, people's views vary depending on different variables, how, how they grew up, their, their belief systems, and what they hear on TV, and how their level of education, just different variables in the process. But I can tell you that the big picture indicates that there is truly a very genuine interest in learning more about Siri. Uh, this surpasses the demarcations of my own personal circles of friends and colleagues. Uh, the, because remember, YouTube is open for the public. Uh, it's no longer my Facebook page where I post the content. I, I only advertise by sharing the links to the YouTube channel that I have. So overall, the reactions that I'm getting, the comments that I'm getting on my YouTube channel have largely been very, very positive with some questions a lot of comments, um, a lot of, if you will, uh, uh, testimonies. Apparently, there were a lot of the viewers who had been to these sites prior to posting their comments, mm -hmm. and they would sort of tie up whatever they're seeing on my channel with their own memories. Uh, people who had been to Syria before the conflict started. So in, in a short in a short answer, I can tell you that the uh, reaction to the content has been very, very positive so far. Wonderful. This is great. So, uh, I mean, how about the process of creating this kind of content? Can you walk us through the process uh, that you, you have established 
so far? I mean, but like the mature process that you came up to at this moment. Uh, certainly, I'll be happy to do that. Um, so after creating the channel and after noticing that people truly want to see more, I started putting more effort into the creative process. Uh, and, and I have to tell you, it's a little complicated because, well, maybe complicated isn't the right word. It's time consuming. Uh, and I would like for the people who are watching now to know that this is not my line of profession. I'm a college professor by profession. My, yep. my background is in education and higher education. I do this as a hobby. It's, it's more of a passion uh, than, than a, a line or a professional line. So to find time for it is or can be challenging sometimes. But I can tell you quickly what the steps are. I always start with reading about a particular site. And I'll give you an example. Whenever I created the documentary about uh, Masyaf Castle, uh, the mm -hmm. uh, Order of the Assassins, the okay. first thing I did was to read more about the assassins. I mean, I had already known some information about them, but most of it was generic, very common knowledge. And I wanted to be very specific, especially when it comes to dates and spe specific historical facts. Uh, so that's the first phase. And it is time consuming because I read multiple books. I don't rely just on one source. I want to make sure that there is a crisscross of information. So that way I know that, okay, I've seen this piece of information here. I've seen it there. Then, then that's, that's a sure thing. Once I have that, once I have the knowledge I need about the episode, I actually start writing my own script. Uh, I, I write in a narrative fashion while honoring the historical facts and the dates and all the chronological events in the chronological order of the events. Once I have the script, then I move on to the filming process. And so that's another thing there because I have to wait until I'm able to travel to Syria right. in order for me to go to these sites and start filming. I don't really use anything like a hard equipment type uh, I mean, most people probably won't believe this, but I, I kid you not, I use this cell phone. I mean, this is a this is an iPhone 6S. It's now old technically, but it's got a good camera. And so I use my cell phone to film everything and I take my time with it. I, I spend the entire day at the site. Uh, I hire a driver who takes me there. Sometimes a friend or a family member takes me to the site. So once I have all the shots that I need, uh, then I basically store the files on my laptop. After that, um, I bring in actors. And this is a very, very challenging part in the process because I need your audience uh, to understand uh, these actors that participate are strictly, you know, they're volunteers. I don't pay them. So uh, basically, I donate the costume, I buy the costume on Amazon, and they donate their time. And then I have to figure out the logistics. Like if I have five actors or 10 or 15 or whatever, I need to make sure that I pick up a time that suits everybody involved, which is very challenging for me. But once I have that, then I can move on to putting all the pieces together. And I use a very basic... Um, uh, program. Uh, it's an editing program called VideoPad, which people can download for free from, from, from the internet. And then I put in all the music and all the sound effects, and then I play with the, uh, with the, uh, with the content. I add the drone shots. Then I add the voiceovers at the very, very end. Once I have a clear picture of the, uh, of the, um, how the narrative is going to be, how the events are going to unfold in the content, I simply uh, record the voiceovers. And at that point, it just becomes more like a, or like different pieces that you put together to create a full picture. It's like a puzzle. Great. So yeah, this is really fascinating. So just, just for the sake of understanding the effort that you put into it. So let's say a five minute video, like the uh, uh, Order of the Assassins uh, video, I think it's five or six minutes. Uh, can we safely say it, it? It took you like maybe 
40 or more hours to put it together. I mean, this is not to mention the, the time of travel and the time to coordinate pe other people's calendars and so on and so forth, uh, or even maybe more than that. I don't know. You tell me. Well, how, mu how much time did it take you to uh, put this short video together? Yeah, so the, the, the film about the assassins is actually 10 minutes. Uh, minutes. After yeah. having... Yes, sir. So after having all the pieces, which took me uh, truly two trips to Syria, because the first time I went there, it was so windy, I couldn't get anything done. So I had to travel again. And ironically enough, in the winter time, when yeah. you would naturally expect more wind, but uh, but that wasn't the case. It was very quiet, uh, overcast, but pretty quiet. And I was able to film the whole thing. Uh, and it worked out really well. After putting all the pieces, after I had everything ready in files, because uh, you know I organized everything in files. This is from music. This is the actors. This is the front side of the castle. This is the drone file, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It takes easily. Um, it, it takes easily a week uh, if I dedicate, and this is approximate. It's not always the case, but approximately two, maybe three hours a day, it easily takes a week. And there's a reason for that. It's because when you when you add effects to the content, it changes things. So you kind of have to go back and forth and make sure everything has, everything is in the right place and where it needs to be. Yep. And before you, you, you make the final production or the final cut. So after you do the final cut, you know, I, I usually just forget about it. I just leave it alone for a couple of weeks. I, I, I try to forget about the pieces because I try to come back and look at it with fresh eyes. So that way, as if I'm seeing it for the first time. So that way, if there is any particular flaw that needs attention and needs some kind of revisions, um, I can go back in and tweak it. And then I have the final outcome. So easily a week, maybe two weeks. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of effort. So uh, this is really intriguing, especially that you are uh, uh, you're in the area of education, and education is all about learning. And uh, what you mentioned is is a classic methodology in the area of uh, learning uh, when it comes to the uh, learning mind. Uh, the fact the fact that you let it sit and then you come back to it later and so on and so forth. The, the idea of spacing that work rather than just cramming it all in one shot. That is really very essential. So the other question I have for you is you mentioned that you do the uh, voiceover at the end. So there are some scenes in your videos where you are standing uh, and, and speaking in the middle of the uh, of the area you're filming. So how, how do you do that stuff? I mean, how do you do it? Uh, I mean, is it done afterwards and you do the voiceover afterwards? Or is that really what you were saying when you were standing there? Right. That's a very good question. Uh, thank you. Um, so if you look at my script, and I'm happy to share at any point, uh, I always I, I always divide my script into sections. And I'll have like labels. I'll say, for example, I have like a subtitle voiceover, and then this section in front of the camera. And so that way, I know how to track it. And so even if I film the pieces in front of the camera separately, when I have the script, I go by that, I'm essentially narrating and I can put the pieces that way together. So I will say voiceover and I have all the recordings. And in this section, I have the video in front of the camera. So I put them together. So when you're watching the final outcome, it, it looks like it's one solid story coming together. Right. You don't see the bits and the pieces. That's the part that I create. That's the part that I see in order for me to put it together in a way that makes sense to the audience. If mm -hmm. you're asking me how I do the voiceovers and how I do the camera, like who films if I'm filming with my phone, I actually have a um, very funny thing to say to you on that one. Um, I ask random people to hold the phone for me. Every time I went to these places, if I don't have a driver with me, uh, and in most cases I do because I try to hire drivers to take me to the sites if it's not a family member. But even if it's a driver or a family member or somebody who happens to be at the site 
just also taking pictures and trying to, you know, have a nice time there. Uh, I usually just say, hey, do you mind holding the phone for me for just a few seconds? I got to say a couple of words. And most people agree. I mean, I've, I've had I've been fortunate with uh, meeting a lot of kind people uh, on, you know, uh, these multiple trips that I made that don't really mind holding the phone for a few minutes. Uh, there were a couple of times when I would be a little bit pushy because I would say some words that don't come out the way I want them to be. So I would say, hey, hold it again and again and again. And finally, when I have the, the part that I like, I say, thank you. I shake hands and I move on. But most of these people are either um, the drivers that I hire to take me there or maybe family members who tag along. Or if it's neither one of those, it's usually visitors just like myself who happen to be at the site, people I don't know, that, that agree to hold the phone for me. So, so question, I mean, the, the process that you mentioned and described earlier and, and all that, uh, uh, the, the, the organization of different files and different things and putting them all together, this is not something that comes easily to uh, someone. So did you uh, go through some, any training, any like courses, or did you read about it? How did you come up with this process? Or is it something that you just developed over time by trial and error? Exactly. It developed over the course of time by trial and error, I would I would observe how other people create documentaries. Uh, there are thousands of those on the web. Um, I would observe, and I'll be honest with you, not all of these styles of documentaries work for me. Um, I, I had, if you will, a knack for creating a content that is both truthful and mixed with some action. The thing, that, the thing that I noticed about the documentaries that I saw on the web as samples, if you will, was that they're very, um, they're, they're, they're credible, they're very good, but for me, at least from my perspective, they lack the action that could attract the audience. And I know my audience very well. I know what my audience wants. My audience wants the truth but they also want to enjoy the content. It's entertainment. That's what they want. And so for me, I always try to find like a good sample to watch. And then I would try things on my own. I did not take any courses. Uh, this is something that I played with over the course of time, um, dabbled into it, if you will, looked at samples, uh, watched what other people did, how they did it. And then over the course of time, I developed my own style. This is great. This is really uh, very impressive. Another question I have for you. You already mentioned that you use your phone as your primary camera. Yeah. You have some drain, uh, some drone shots. Are, are these yeah. like with your own drone? or um, And also you buy costume. What other gear do you use? Uh, for yeah. yeah, so, so I do have a drone. Uh, it's called a DJI Mini SE. Uh, it's a very small drone. Uh, content creators who might be watching this interview may have a good knowledge on that. It's very small, and because it's too small and light, um, you're not required to register the drone with the authority. Uh, but if it's if it gets heavy, if it's if it's big, then then you're gonna have to register and get a permit to fly it. So I do have a drone. I also rely on uh, some friends who work with the media inside Syria who already have some footage and I get the footage from them. So it's, mm -hmm. it's basically divided into two sections. I have my own content and then I have some friends on the ground that work with the Ministry of Information. Um, they work with the media and they have badges and they have cards and they have their own drones. And I ask some of them to volunteer whatever content they have. And then based on that, I decide which part I want to use and which part I want to dismiss uh, in lieu of something else. So that's the drone part. Um, I don't use any professional cameras at all. Uh, I, I like my phone. I think it does the job. Um, I use a small microphone. Uh, it's the kind of microphones you would clip to your, to your uh, shirt or jacket. Uh, it does the job really well. I bought it on Amazon. Uh, it's very doable. It's very accessible. 
and it's very effective. As far as the costume goes, it's also on Amazon. Um, I, I bought the whole thing there, the, the helmets, the swords, um, all the chains, uh, all the, <laughs> the things that you see the actors wearing essentially are all from Amazon. And uh, it's, it's all a matter, I think for me, it's all a matter of knowing where and how you're using the camera. And once you know how and where in from which angle you're using the camera, I mean, I've seen it happen from experience. You could come up with something truly, truly nice and effective. And you wouldn't be able yeah. to tell uh, if it was, you know, uh, just a, an amateur kind of uh, endeavor or a professional endeavor. It's just, it's amazing what you can do with a phone or a camera when you have the right variables in place. Yeah, speaking about uh, how nice and good quality, great quality those uh, simple devices can can produce. Uh, let's just try to show uh, some uh, some example. Eleven forty, Western Syria. A group of ruthless warriors take over the castle of Masyaf and declare its massive walls their headquarters and trusted messiah. Today we journey to the former kingdom of one of the most mysterious and most fascinating creeds in history. We journey to Masyaf, Syria, the home of the legendary assassins. Okay, so now. All right, so, so that was just a sample of uh, of your production, and there are so many other beautiful samples that uh, our audience can look up and see on your uh, on your YouTube YouTube channel, basically. But uh, if you can tell us about you, you already mentioned some of the challenges that you see and uh, the rewards. But is there anything else in terms of challenges and rewards you can tell us about while, while you're doing those great documentaries? Yeah, certainly. So the biggest challenge for me is is getting the actors, truly. I mean, this has been uh, in in most, I would say, of the films, the at least the, when I started doing that professionally, uh, not the amateur phase, uh, was getting uh, enough actors and getting willing, willing actors because you may get one or two people who will say, okay, fine, we will participate, um, but but when you need a large number of people, that is um, that's that's really challenging because people have different interests, they have different schedules, they may not have the same passion you have for the content, they may not know what the content will be about, how it's going to turn out. But I've found. The process to get a tad easier over the course of time because of two main reasons. The first one is um, this is very recent. It happened uh, less than a year ago. I actually connected with the acting community in in the Northeast, uh, in places like Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Uh, so I was able to actually have some some ground with them. I, I connected with multiple people. And the second reason is, is because now I have samples on YouTube that I could forward to them and say, hey, this is what it's going to look like if you are willing to participate. Mm -hmm. I give everybody credit, no matter how small the role is. They all have their names in the credits, which I think is also ethically right. And it's also encouraging because people want to be acknowledged, even if their roles are small. Uh, but that was the main problem for me is is getting enough actors who are willing to participate. And, and again, I know I'm reiterating this, but I think it's important to know these are all volunteers. I'm not paying them to participate in these in these documentaries. The rewards obviously are more of a of a even though my my purpose for this is to uh, educate because I am in education but also to entertain. Uh, and the reward always comes back in the form of a comment that says, I've enjoyed the content. Uh, you know, this is really cool. This is really 
nice to watch. Oh, I've been there before. Those kinds of comments that make you feel like, okay, the content is indeed resonating. Right, absolutely. Uh, and then just one more thing to mention, those actors are for the most part are here in the States. You mentioned in, in the Northeast, in Rhode Island and other places like this. And the, the whatever they're acting is superimposed on the video that you take or shoot back home in Syria, right? So, so there are actors in Syria as well. Uh, okay. Whenever I go to the castles, I actually ask multiple friends who live there to tag along. Now, mind you, not everybody is willing, not everybody has an interest, not everybody has the time to do that. But yes, there are actors inside Syria who tag along with me to these ancient sites to shoot the scenes. And very recently, at least with the uh, documentary on Margat Castle, a lot of people participated. A lot of people are now interested in participating in upcoming episodes that I will be shooting later on in the future. And I'm very, very thankful that they are willing to participate and uh, uh, they're, they've done a very good job. So it's both in Syria and in the United States where I connected with actors to participate. So a couple more questions. The first one is why castles in particular? I mean, there are many, many other things in Syria that you can bring out and talk about or make documentaries about. Why castles in particular? The just Yeah, the so, yeah certainly. Now, and this is a very good question. So this is what it seems like, that I'm only interested in castles. But really, this is phase one. So I'll, I'll tell you this, and I want your audience to know this. I've actually created a list, a list of ancient archaeological sites inside Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and in Europe. And I'm trying to target each one at a time in a separate episode. I've even targeted certain sites within the United States of America. I will reveal yeah. each one at a time. But right now, I'm starting with Syria's castles. But there will be other parts that will focus on other sites within Syria. And specifically, I can give you an example that I think might answer the question directly. I will be creating a film, a short film, roughly 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, under the title, The Road to Damascus, where I will be talking about Christianity in Syria and the journey of John the Baptist and, of course, St. Thomas, which, as you know, you lived in Damascus. Uh, the gate of Tuma, or Thomas, is also a standing symbol of that particular religious figure. And uh, of course, we have Malula. So it seems like I'm only focusing on castles, which is true for now. But the intention is to move forward with other ancient sites and archaeological sites in Syria. Great. So what's your next project? My next project will also will actually be about the hospitalers. Uh, we're continuing that. I want to finish with the hospitalers before I move on to something else. See, that's why I told you, you know, it's, I'm, I, I have that list. Move forward with one item at a time. So the next one will be a documentary called Crack de Chevalier, The Return. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I've already created something on Crack de Chevalier. But this one, right. The Return, is going to be more detailed. It's going to be more dramatic. I'm going to have a lot more actors than the one on Margat Castle. And I want to focus on the role of the Knights Hospitaller as a Christian order in building the castles of Syria, at least during the crusade, uh, the crusader area, uh, during the Crusades. Then I'll move forward with the Knights Templar, and then I'll move forward with all the other items that I will reveal in due time. Wonderful. So... Um... I mean, this this was great. I mean, that's a lot of information, great information. Uh, one last thing I'd like to ask you, any particular message you would like to convey to the audience, in particular, young uh, Syrian Americans uh, who have similar passions or hobbies uh, in terms of how they go about um, bringing those hobbies out and making them beneficial for them and for the community at large? Absolutely. I'll be happy to tell you right now, um, 
the people who are listening to me at the moment, if you have a passion for this kind of content, pursue it and pursue it with a passion. Love what you do and do what you love. And I mean that literally. In other words, put forth the effort, put forth the time, be organized, be structured, and do and take all the steps systematically. Don't rush it because once it's out on YouTube, it's out on YouTube. I know you can theoretically take it down, but it would be wasting time and effort. They're going to have to revise and re-upload. Don't do that. Take a year's time, a year and a half if you have to. But once it's out, make sure you're proud of it. I will tell you something else, and this is to everybody involved here, whether they're Syrian or not. These civilizations that are, no, that are, that are now forgotten, essentially this is where humanity started. Let's just agree that this is where the recorded human history started, uh, civilization-wise. In other words, no matter how you identify, whether you identify as a Syrian or an American or a Frenchman or an Australian, or it doesn't matter really how you identify, if you track the roots, chances are high, you'll find one or two ancestors of yours coming from that land. So be proud of that and honor it. Honor it in a way that you believe they deserve to be honored. Great, and this actually um, draws also to other skills um, young Syrian Americans may have, not just filmmaking, maybe they have other skills in other areas. Just pursue your, your passion and uh, make sure you advance your skills. There's only something good coming out of it in, in the end. Well, Absolutely. thank you very much, uh, Ali. It was very nice talking to you. And we uh, would love to uh, have you again come back in the future. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I appreciate all the um, kind words you shared with me today. And uh, thank you to your audience for uh, remaining uh, with us. And thank you, folks. I wish everybody the best. All right. Thank you.